right, we're going to reconvene our board meeting. You may have noticed that we started our board meeting downstairs this evening. That's so that we had the opportunity to recognize our retirees and to allow all their family members that wish to be here to participate in that uh, event as well. We thought it might be a bit too crowded up here to do that. It was a joy to be with them, of course, and to recognize all the years of service that they represent for this district. And we're now going to pick up again with the agenda uh, up here in our regular meeting space. And we are at this point in time on item five on the agenda, which is board meeting minutes, May 19th, that's tonight. And this is discussion and approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of May 5th. We don't uh, move and second the minutes. So if there are any comments or questions or corrections to the minutes, please speak now. I hear none, Bart. So the minutes stand approved. Move on to item number six, district highlights and recognitions for May 19th this evening. And we do have an additional recognition. I told you we had recognized our retirees downstairs. We have a recognition tonight of Ohio Health. And Mr. Hershiser, would you come to the podium? Thank you, Dr. Mr. Baker. Dr. Kellogg, uh, members of the board, businesses large and small, corporate owned or family run, play a key role in supporting the community and local schools. From helping schools with in-kind or financial contributions, donating to scholarship programs, supporting extracurricular activities, to offering internship opportunities, volunteering in the schools and sponsoring field trips, businesses contribute to their schools in many ways. The Ohio School Boards Association recognizes these types of businesses through their Business Honor Roll Award Program. Ohio Health Corporation is this kind of business. Since 2007, Westerville City Schools has partnered with Ohio Health for athletic training and healthcare partnership services. In 2009, Ohio Health began providing office space for the Westerville, Westerville City Schools Enrollment Center at a cost of $1 per year. This partnership has provided a financial benefit to Westerville City Schools of more than $69,000 per year during that time. In addition to athletic training services Ohio Health provides at no cost, um, Ohio Health also provides uh, coaching classes, CPR classes, wrestling weight assessments, impact testing for concussions, physical exams, um, additional uh, event coverage and physician coverage at no cost. On behalf of Westerville City Schools, I am pleased to share with the Board of Education and the community that Ohio Health Corporation is being recognized by the Ohio School Boards Association, or OSBA, as OSBA Business Honor Roll Honoree. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Bill Davis and Janet Scott from Ohio Health. All right, moving on in the agenda this evening to item seven for reports this evening. There are no reports on the agenda tonight, so we'll move on to item eight. Item eight is the first portion of public comment on the agenda this evening. The first portion of public comment is limited to comments that are about items that are on the agenda tonight. Speakers are limited to five minutes, and with that we have one individual signed up to speak for the first portion. That's Doug Krinsky. Um, go sign the form for the second portion, if you would. Oh, sure, that's fine. I just want to make sure your name's on the list. Okay. Is his name going to, you're going to put the name on the list? I wouldn't want Doug to be forgotten. 
So with that, there are no speakers signed up for the first portion of public comment. So we will again <coughs> move forward in the agenda to item nine on the agenda. It's financial reports for the evening. 9.01 is a resolution to approve the financial reports and investments as of April 2014. And the financial report does list all funds ending April 2014. Could I have a motion on this resolution, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, Mr. Griffith. Madam President, members of the board, the financials, just to give you a quick overview, the fiscal year to date for general fund revenue is 147654000 The fiscal year to date general fund expenditures are 110962000 All funds, fiscal year to date revenue is 191977000 and the fiscal year to date expenditures, all funds are 150146000 are there comments or questions? <coughs> Hearing none, Bart, would you call the roll? Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. French? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The financial reports, reports and investments as of April 2014 have been approved. 9.02 is a resolution to approve the updated five-year forecast for F year 2014 through FY18. Could I have a motion on this resolution, please? So moved. Thank you. One motion. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, I will turn this over to the treasurer as well. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, this is the five-year forecast updated version of the, basically, of what we presented in October. Hopefully you guys can all see this up here. I like to use some visuals. So I gave you guys a printed copy. Um, I'll probably go into a little bit more detail tonight just because we have two new board members online with us. So if I get too tedious, I apologize. But uh, the rest is in here. So if I don't cover it and you have questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, I also, if you notice my presentations, you've seen this probably twice a year for the last three and a half years. I typically try to make sure audience is educated on this as well. So I'll tell you why we're doing it. So as we get started, uh, this is the updated forecast, May 19th. The reason we do this is because of the uh, 122nd General Assembly basically said thou shalt do five-year forecasts, and so we do those. Uh, well, the reasons it <laughs> tells us to do them is we also, it's called a 412 certificate for anybody out there. 412 certificate is a certificate if you sign them, you know what you are, but most of them don't sign them. The people who sign them are the board president, the superintendent, and the treasurer. We have to certify that we have money on hand that we can pay our bills. So if we have a contract, it has a 412 certificate assigned to it that says we can pay it. So that's also what this is also used for is the 412 certificate. Uh, statutorily, we have to do these by October 31st of each year, and then we do an update by May 31st of each, where, each year. You can do these daily if you wanted to. Typically, most districts do them twice. You might see them monthly sometimes, but we typically do them twice. What I tried to do, <clears throat> so that I don't scare anybody, this is half the forecast up here, okay? And I tried to break it into pieces. This first half is the revenue portion only. And for those of you, when you look at this, and I'll use my little green pointer, there's really three sections. This section over here tells you what kind of revenue it is. This section, 2011 through 13, shows you what the actuals were for the last three years. Fiscal year 14 is the fiscal year we're in, and you're doing a forecast for the next four years. Okay, so that's kind of how you read this part of it, it's revenue. So what I tried to give you is a snapshot of just revenue. I'll go in line by line here after this one. But I want to give you just a snapshot of this is just the revenue side. The reason I highlighted yellow in up here, yellow up here is highlighted because that's the property tax line. In calendar year 2017, the, the emergency levy has to, uh, we can't assume it's going to be passed. So we show it as a negative in 2018 and it's shown up as half of the negative half the valuation is the negative not the full 16 million because fiscal year 18 is the last half of 17 which we're still collecting the levy and first half of fiscal year 18 which we're not so in fiscal year 18 you see half of the levy come off we show i show it in yellow so it draws your attention to it so you know we're not assuming the collection of that levy okay the next one, what I tried to do is to give you, when you look at the format, this row right here is basically the five-year forecast that I highlighted. This section down here is the changes from October to today. 
Okay, so the first one you look up here, the reason you see two together, that's the public utility personal property tax and the property tax allocation. We receive those monies that is tax money for the most part, but we receive that from the state of Ohio. Uh, it's paid on the, the, the taxpayer's behalf. Uh, I did one in, in my notes down here. I do draw out the fact that you'll remember when they changed what they call the, the commercial activity tax or CAT tax, when they changed that in 2006, this district lost the equivalent of $5.4 million per year. So I still make sure people understand that we, we, we lost that every year. It just it went away to try to promote business in Ohio. But uh, as you can see today, the lines up here are accurate now. I mean, from 2014 through 18 does not show the 5.4. It shows what we're actually collecting. The other line, the 1.050 line, this bottom line here, the property tax allocation, that has to do with the homestead rollback portion. And if you remember the last biennium, any new levies that any district passed as of November of 13, the state was no longer paying that portion of the homestead rollback tax on the homeowner's behalf. The levy that was passed here in 2012 has that included. If we get to 2017 and that levy is deemed to be renewed, that would also still be covered under the old rule. That would still be the state would still pay that homestead rollback on the behalf of the taxpayers because it was passed prior to the date. Okay, just a little tidbit for you. <clears throat> the next one, state foundation. If you remember, the state changed the rules uh, again in J July of last year uh, it was still quite they were still playing with it when we did this in October so there's a couple changes I'll show um, this district uh, received two really two thousand one hundred seventy seven dollars per student based on the valuation and generates thirty seven percent of the, of the school district's general fund expenditures um, casino revenue just to draw your attention we do receive fifty two dollars per student we collected roughly seven hundred and forty eight thousand um, dollars in this fiscal year due to uh, casino as opposed to 321,000 last year because of it being phased in. I threw this up here for the quiz for the end of the program. <laughs> um, the state changed it and it's really, I don't expect you guys to follow this. I at least want to show it so you could re realize what the state did. In the past, the state would basically said, we're going to give you $5,730 per student. If you have 10 less students, you take that number times the 5,735 and you get less dollars. If you have more, same thing, you get more dollars. What the state changed it to is now they've basically changed it to a district per pupil valuation index a median in taxpayer income index, and they take your pers your district's index compared to what the state index does on average. So we could do nothing on our own. We could stay exactly the same. If the state changes, you will get we will get less money or more money based on what the state average does. It's different, and then that money is times fifteen thousand students. So you're, it's, it's sort of a bigger, you're gonna, either going to lose big or gain big, but they changed the rules. It's no longer just a specific dollar amount per student. They're going to base it on these valuation indexes and median income indexes. And here's, here's an example of how this works. The valuation for Westerville City Schools is roughly two point, let's just say $2 billion. If you divide that by 15,000 kids, you're going to get a number. If you lose 50 kids, you divide that number or less number into 2 billion, your valuation per pupil is going to be higher now because you've divided less students into it. If the state does nothing else and we go up, we now are deemed wealthier. You get less money. And it's less money, less money per all the students in your district, not, not just the ones that left. So it's more confusing. I, I put this in there just for your reading pleasure. You can go through and look at this. Um, there's still, uh, you'll, you'll see in a minute, one of the reasons our state funding increased this fiscal year was because of how this was done. It still wasn't quite understood. They went back into fiscal year 13 and tweaked some of the numbers. And you'll see in a minute why we, why we were the benefit of about $1.2 million because of that. Anyway, that's just for your viewing. Uh, this is the unrestricted grants and aid. Um, this is what we receive from the state. Unrestricted grants and aid is the money we get from the state of Ohio that you can pretty much do anything legal you want to do with it. Doesn't matter what you spend on, as long as it's legal, you're fine. The restricted grants and aid means it has a purpose behind it and you can only spend it for those purposes. And so you see this is the line that's on the forecast that shows up. The difference is in when the state redid their calculations, you can see that unrestricted, we actually increased seven hundred and two thousand dollars. It's because the state tweaked the way that they did their formula. Basically, it netted us three hundred thousand dollars last fiscal year, but because we're in a new fiscal year fourteen, it was an additional three hundred thousand. So that's why you see seven hundred thousand dollars difference. They tweaked their formulas on what they were looking at and what they were counting. 
The, the restricted grants and aid, um, also let me back up, the, the unrestricted really was the um, preschool. Preschool used to be funded by student, or excuse me, by um, units, education units, now it's funded by student. So they changed how they funded it. So that was worth basically $700,000 for us. Um, the, the other part, the restricted grants and aid has to do with economic div disadvantage and it was in those calculations that I showed you sooner. That was the difference of $570,000 when they tweaked their numbers. So that $1.2 million due is basically part of last year and part of this year was the change in state aid. We still, um, it's not on this slide, maybe it's on the next one. When the state changed their formula, uh, I must, let me go stay here for a second. Um, let me go back. The state, if you remember when we did our state funding, when they changed the state law uh, rules, they only basically said you could only go up six and a half percent. Whatever you got in fiscal year 13, the most you can increase is six and a half percent. That's still the case, that six and a half for us climbed because of how they figure, refigured their numbers. So that's the reason you see an extra. Uh, they also are saying that you're still only going to receive 10.5% for next year. That's still in law. I don't expect that to change. That should generate an additional $3.4 million. We've expected that. That's in the forecast. We're not really updating that. That's a known fact. That's a two-year law. What happens after that, and you'll see our assumptions, we're assuming a 1.5% increase in state aid in each of the next four years. Okay, everybody understand that one? We, you could predict two, you could predict three, you could predict zero. Uh, me, I try to be a little conservative. I'd rather tell you, be sitting here next year telling you that we actually got more than we were supposed to versus less than we were supposed to. So I'm a little conservative, and so we put in there one and a half percent across the four years. We, we'll know more in another year, but for right now, that's my recommendation. <clears throat> the next line is all other operating uh, revenues. Uh, this takes into consideration um, such as pay to participate, building rental, tuition from other districts, school, school fees. As you can see, we didn't miss that by too much on this one. Um, and then what I gave you on this one is a summary. I'm not sure why that's not showing up very well. This next summary, uh, this is the sort of the summary of what changed from October of 2013 when we did the first forecast to what it is today on the forecast. And you can see the assumptions and the differences uh, of the changes from October to today. You can see that in revenue we actually increased $1,556,000 more than anticipated. But 1.2 of that really was state. Any questions so far? Okay. So this one clarification note. So the state still takes into account, I mean, they're actually looking at two things. They're looking at student per pupil as well as a percentage rate. So the, the, the new, new change. Yeah, they're looking at the median in income and economic disadvantage. There's a couple of things they're looking at, but they're looking at it as a, as a how you compare it to the state yeah. average. Yes, but they still, then, then they come back to the counting heads, too, so. They're uh, still, yeah, they're yeah. still, you still have the number, yeah. but it's not as, it's not as sort of much Bad by the book as what it used to. Okay. Yes. And even though state aid is up, in actuality, we're still continuing the shift toward more reliance on local property taxes. So the amount from the state is up, but the reliance on local property taxes is still significant, 62%. Yes. Page 11. Page 11 is a sort of a summary of the five-year forecast for uh, of what the forecast would look like. I just highlighted that copy for you so you can see what those numbers look like. Uh, again, I won't ask you to read this. We'll go through and I tried to do some bits and pieces. Personal services, uh, just a reminder, this is the second year of a two-year freeze that uh, every staff member in the district uh, is it currently in, this two-year freeze. Um, next year, the, the, the teachers are on the third year of a three-year contract. Uh, there are raises built in the third year. Uh, we are currently in negotiations or will be in negotiations with the other unions of the district. We've started that process. Uh, we really haven't changed any of the assumptions and the same assumption we have at the bottom is we, we allocated $450,000 for staffing needs. Could be new staff, could be really anything to do with the staff. If the state tell, mandates something new, you've allocated money for it. Doesn't mean you're gonna spend it, but we've tried to keep within those boundaries. That assumption did not change. And again, this is an update. This really isn't a new forecast. It's kind of an update. Personal services, again, I gave you the line that shows that the five-year forecast on the top that shows you what the past three and the next uh, current and the next four are. And then you can see forecasted. Uh, we're actually spent, as of today, 1.5 million less than what we had anticipated spending. And that can be a lot of different factors. You know, we, our hiring practices, for one, have saved us a lot of money. Um, not, a, not as much many subs, so we didn't fill some positions. So there's a lot of things that take into consideration of that million and a half. Um, 
but as of right now, we're expecting to be a million and a half less than what we had predicted in, in um, salaries. The retirement, uh, again, just to give you some highlights to, so you remember, in case you don't remember where we were, um, in 2014, this calendar year, our premiums did go up by 7%. We assumed a 10% increase across all four years of the five-year forecast to current in the next four. We assume a 10% increase in there. Uh, one of the things is to remind you, we did go self-insured all of calendar year 13. Those numbers came out that we saved roughly $2.2 million by being self-insured last year. And then a reminder of the, the 95-100 premium. That what, really what we did uh, with Medical Mutual in that one is they basically came to us and said, listen, we'll pay the first 95% of the, of the bill. Anything over that, you pay it. If you don't pay it, you basically save it. That was a savings to the district of about $800,000. One of the things that it's not changing right now, but probably will, I'm assuming we'll watch this one. We added $600,000 on this line item under employees retirement for the Affordable Care Act. There's still a lot of unknowns. We, we don't know how many people we're going to have to uh, substitutes that we're going to have to offer that are going to qualify as, you know, if they work 30 hours or more average 30 hours or more per week for the year period, we have to offer them insurance. There's a lot of fees associated with this. There's a lot of penalties associated if you don't comply. So, you know, if you have to add, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 to 50, 50 staff members at $500,000 each, that's, or excuse me, $15,000 each, that's a lot of money. I'm not sure 600,000 will be enough. So we're kind of waiting to see what that line does. It could go up, it could go down, but that's what we beer marked it for was the Affordable Health Care Act that could cost this district more money. We wanted to allocate it. And when what might we know some clarity? <clears throat> well, we have to, well, they give clarity every no, day. No government comments. I'm just asking for clarity. No, it, it's just that the clarity gets, I guess, clearer as the time goes on. Okay. I mean, they give us, there's, every day there's new rules come out and the new clarifications, but they change. And so we don't know. We're in what's called a, a year evaluation period. We're looking at a year. We, we're keeping track of all of our substitutes' times and hours and how much they work and how much they're, you know, and probably, probably you, th you think it would be simple. Well, sure, you can just count, you know, a bus driver works six, a sub works six hours a day six hours well what if they're a library aide or something or they volunteer as a sub food service or something so there's stacking going on so we're trying to track all those hours the penalties are severe if you miss the um if you miss that required calculation you can I think it's two thousand dollars per covered life as a penalty so this, so they're staggering uh i think we figured the penalties could be as much as two million dollars if you miss those so we're watching those i think as the year goes closer enough people are screaming um, that they're trying to get all the answers right we don't have all the answers yet. We're using our, our Gallagher, our insurance is helping us. We're talking about other treasurers, see what they're doing. There's different rules out there people are trying to do. One of the things that you're going to hear me bring back to you is what we call, uh, I'm suggesting we have what's called a bronze plan for insurance. Right now we have one insurance plan. If we end up through the course of this process and we have to hire a substitute because we had to work 30 hours or more, that's one hurdle. The next hurdle would be, is it affordable? If it's not affordable, that allows them to go to the consortium, which means now we pay a penalty because of that. Well, one of the things, if this district does what's called a bronze plan, we institute our own minimum level plan, and then if they go to the consortium after that, we're not penalized because we've offered them a plan that is, uh, that is technically affordable. So that's one thing is you're going to hear me bring in up this summer. Hopefully that's in place by next, uh, before January, is to put a plan in place that would qualify as a, a sort of an offset. And that's really the reason, by, uh, the reason by my question, because I didn't want people to get the idea that we are just shooting in the dark here, but we are trying to hit a moving target. Yeah. And I, I think that the work that you've done here, and I personally like this idea of a bit of a tiered process for the health care to avoid that potential significant uh, penalty. So... I just wanted you to bring out, just so the people here, that we understand we're hitting a moving target. We understand that it's a bit of a shell game, and I don't mean that negatively toward mm -hmm. the government and others. But we, we, are, we are trying to do this in an intelligent, forecasted manner without having all the numbers. Right. We're trying to be proactive. Thank you. Okay. Ooh, this slide got lost somehow. Uh, this is the purchase services, and I apologize, you, can, I don't think, well, you can see most of it. Uh, purchase services, uh, this line actually went up by 681,000. We're, we're sort of looking at this one today. 
uh, we believe the part of there's a, there again there's a lot of factors it's not just one thing purchase services are spent one of the things we did in the forecast in October is we reduced our assumptions to a one and a half percent increase where it had been three percent all this time you know could that have been a factor we know that we're paying more for uh, students who are going to community schools we know we're paying more for students who have the autism scholarship or the Peterson scholarship um, and so we also know there was a timing issue here uh, our operations director, we had $211,000 last year encumbered. This report looks at expenditures, not encumbrances. And so we know we paid $211,000 that was encumbered in the, in the sp spring. We paid that this, this uh, mm. fall. So there's a lot of things that make up this number here did go higher than we expected. And we'll, we'll dig in more of this and tell you why at a different time. Supplies and materials, um, nothing to shout about here. Um, we were pretty much on what, what was expected. Uh, capital outlay. This is this one takes a little bit of explaining because it's going to show up again in, in the in the fall. When we did our five-year forecast in 2014, we allocated. A, a, we didn't we didn't budget it. I shouldn't say we didn't budget. We didn't appropriate it. We alloc we allocated a million dollars for this new technology roadmap, and we said we wouldn't spend it unless there was a plan in place. Well, the plan in place is kind of in now, but they haven't had time to spend it. So and so in with the plan in place, they were accounting on that million dollars this year. So when you see the minus $1.4 million here, and we did the October forecast, we had a million dollars for technology, we had 500,000 we added for capital improvement, and we had 500,000 we added to replace all the speakers and audio equipment throughout the district. We haven't spent all of that. So the reason you see the difference is 1.48, we've actually reduced it from this year's five-year forecast. But if you look at the numbers in 2015, you'll see it show back up here because that million dollars is still expected and needed for the roadmap, just because we didn't spend it right now, we are going to spend it next year. So we sort of shifted it. So that's why you see the 1,428 difference is because we've sort of, and Mr. LaRose is doing some capital improvement that we're not also not gonna spend until the summer. And again, this is based on expenditures, not on encumbrances. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see the difference in 1.4. It'll be added back into the next year forecast so that you still see it. Other objects, um, nothing much here. Yeah, it's off 220,000. This has a lot to do with uh, Franklin County Educational Service Center. One of the reasons we're under expenditures here, if you remember, um, every three years, this, the county does a, 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 an assessment, a reappraisal. Um, this year, they decided that a year ago when they did the reappraisal that they took from us too much money, so they gave it back as a refund. That's why you see the refund. It's roughly $229,000 as a refund we got back from the county because they didn't need as much money as they thought they would. Um, transfers out for some of you that are new. The 009 fund is a, is a uniform school accounting fund. It's used, it's basically money in, money out. It's for students. When they pay their fees, it goes into this align. Uh, one of the reasons you see a transfer in there, you'll see a transfer usually once a year, maybe twice. If we have a student who's on free and reduced lunch, we can't charge them fees. So the general fund will transfer money into that 009 account to offset the fees that couldn't be charged so that we still have the money to spend for those students. In the in the uh, second paragraph, the transfer of funds is 65000 per year. We set this up a year ago. Uh, we'll probably transfer here next month. Uh, the three turf fields at the high schools will at some point need to be replaced. So what we did is we looked at all the money that we were spending to taking care of the process, where the grass fees or mowing the grass, marking the lines, whatever. We looked at those funds to see what we were spending every year. We took those accounts. We're also adding to it any, any building rentals that may be using the fields. But we wanted to make sure that in 10 to 12 years, when the fields come time to need to be replaced, when you all are on the board and I'm not here, you're going to be wondering why, why didn't Mr. Griffith set up an account to pay for this? This is the account to pay for that. We're going to try to set aside funds every year. If, if, we, have building, if we have field rentals and it's $80,000, it will all go in there. I just don't think you're going to see that kind of rental. So we're trying to offset it with general fund money so that in 10 to 12 years, when it comes time to replace those fields, the, there's money in the board account to pay that. So we're transferring money each year into that account for future. Okay. Um, this page here, when you look at it, I won't go over all. This is a summary of each of the lines we talked about. For instance, you know, when you say, well, there's a million and a half from salaries, there's a 493 from benefits. This is a summary of this column here is what we had in October. This is what we have in May, and this is the differences. So you can see that the actual increase to the bottom line of the general fund is roughly $4.5 million combined with the, with the revenue and the, and the uh, expenditures. Our bottom line just uh, got better by $4.5 million. And this is the summary that shows that. 
Um, this is kind of a, I put in here, I won't go over this, this is sort of a revenue overview. Um, talking about what the state's going to give us. It talks about the cap in there at 1.5%, uh, 6.2. It's kind of it talks about what we talked about already, so I won't re review that. Um, I did put in here that the district's 2012 emergency levy uh, is expected to provide a full five-year life cycle, which will need to be renewed in county year 2017, is that's the wish of the board. It has to be renewed in 17 or it goes away. Okay. Um, expenditures, we basically have in there a 3.6% per year to grow for expenditures. Again, the 600,000 is in there for the Affordable Care Act. Um, this page here, again, is just kind of a summary. If you look at the five-year forecast, which is this page here, it's kind of hard to understand. So what I did is I took all the stuff out. I was going to say crap, but I took all the stuff out. And each of the line, the sum. Just did. I know, but the, sum <laughs> the summary lines are on this page. So if you, if you didn't care about all the individual pieces, the summary lines are on here so that you can see the summary lines. And again, you see the $8.3 million down at the bottom, which we, we didn't have it at the top. So that's why when you look at the very top line up here, you can see we dropped from 165 to 158. But down here, we can put it back in It's the assumption that it's going to pass. So that's added then back to the bottom of the, of the line. Again, this is what it looks like if you wonder what the five-year forecast looks like in its entirety. That's sort of the page that gets submitted to the state. This graph here just shows you this board set up a $13 million budget reserve. That green line shows the reserve and then how much cash balances we have on top of that. Okay, so that's the line there. If you're curious of how much we get from the real estate, we collect 64% of our money from the real estate. Uh, all other 4%, property tax 9%. This just gives you the percentage of where the revenue comes from. Uh, general fund expenditures, I will highlight that if you add the salaries and benefits together, it's 78%. I think the state average is between 83 and 85%. So we are well under that average uh, for those two, those two columns. Um, so this just tells you purchase services are at 13%. This just gives you the items. Say that. Say that again. Uh, we are 78%? We are 78. The, the salaries are 58%. The benefits are at 20. Um, so the state average is between 83 to 85%. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And with that, any questions? Mark said I only had five minutes. I think I took six. So. <laughs> Any questions? If you have any questions afterwards, you can stop me. We did meet with the newspaper tonight. Uh, we were still working on this. So somebody say, why didn't any, we, this still is not on board docs because we still, I still don't have all my notes done. We met with the paper at 515 to give them a kind of a heads up to make sure that they get what they need. So if you have any questions on this later, just let me know and I'll meet with you, whatever, to go line by line if you want to. Because I know you're fairly new and this is, this is kind of a, I know I kind of trivialize a little bit, but it's really not. I mean, this is a big thing. So if you want more, just call me. We'll, I'll meet with you. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I have a, a question. Um, it's, it's not trivial. You're exactly, exactly right. And, and I, I'd speak for me. You, you can talk down to me all you want. Uh, trying to talk down. <laughs> no, to you. I know you're not. I'm trying to make That's it simplified. That, it so exactly right. Can see it. Yeah. And I, and I, and I read financials. Um, not nearly to your level, but I, I, I get them. But I really appreciate um, your willingness to go into some of these, some of these, you know, pages after the first two, just to take a few steps down into the weeds a little bit and explain um, the, the implications of if we do this, then this is likely to happen. If we go that direction, then perhaps this will occur uh, because. Uh, you know, it's a moving target for some of this, but we also have to, we have to do this in a, in a, um, in a way that's responsible mm -hmm. to uh, the students for their education, to the uh, community that's uh, funding, and um, to the legacy of previous boards and staff that have tried to bring us this far. So I think that's good stuff. I, I, I'm sure I have questions, 
Uh, I just want to chew and dive a little bit. That's fine. In October, we do the uh, a new version of it, a new updated. So between now and then, we'll be thinking, John, Dr. Kellogg and I will be talking about assumptions. We'll be going forward. If you guys have assumptions, what do you want to see? We can certainly put those numbers and play with them and see what, like, you know, just like science, every action has a reaction. So we can put stuff in there, but it's going to make things change. So you just have to make sure you know what you want in there. I just appreciate what I perceive as your, um, your, um, authentic due diligence in the process. And this isn't me just kind of affirming you in front of folk. I, I, I just see that you and your team, because I know there's a team of people, um, do this with a great understanding of trying to figure out um, the best bang for the buck. In the end, the best bang for the buck. So I, that's, sorry. Just that's a real quick fine. question. You did mention that the casino money uh, mm -hmm. came up. It is in there. It did go up. Well, originally, when it first came in, that was one of our fears. We always yeah. thought that they, you know, they said they're going to give you fifty-two dollars, but are you really going to get it? Or are they yeah. going to absorb it? Yeah. We are truly getting that money. Yeah. We are truly yeah. getting what they said we would yeah. receive. Do you anticipate that continuing to go up? Because I think it's more than you thought would be the first year. Well, yeah. we use the, Mike Sobel is the treasurer at Granville, who used to be, he actually worked for the state when these was came through, and he's very up on these rules, and he's basically telling us he believes it will continue. Well, at least one more year. The, keep in mind, it's a state two-year biennium, yes. so. We know it's going to continue at least one more year. We have it in our assumptions throughout the forecast. So we believe it will continue. Thank you. Well, as you talk about the um, biennial review, in the mid-year biennial review is the College Credit Plus um, issue that's being discussed. So as we look at putting things in and changes that occur, we may very well see changes uh, based on the College Credit Plus, you know, as, as we've looked at what it may cost us based on where we are and where we may be and how that may affect uh, school district budgets, that could be a significant impact on the amount of funds that we have to look at what we want to do to keep our word to um, reduce some of the burdens that have been placed on families across the district and to take care of uh, repairing some of the things that had to be cut and uh, done away with in earlier years. So as we look at making those changes, uh, we have to look at those very prudently and very carefully. We do intend to keep looking and we do intend to keep trying to uh, move that needle, so to speak, on what opportunities we have to offer our children and the opportunities that we have to offer families. But we have to do that within the context of knowing that there will be changes and they won't all necessarily be helpful to us. Are you going to put the updated version of the update online? Yes. Thank you. Anything else that anybody wants to add? I just might add, um, first of all, I appreciate um, Mr. Griffith's uh, good analysis of where with the five-year forecast. And I think um, from my seat watching as we project forward, and he hit on it, <clears throat> we're in the heading into the second year in the biannual budget. Um, unknown factors, as you mentioned, one of them on the legislative docket right now is College Credit Plus. And, and keep in mind, we've gone through a period of what seems a fair amount of legislative process that's put a lot of mandates in front of school systems that are costing dollars and resources, um, online testing, resident educator, new evaluation system, changes to curriculum, some of which we'll see tonight. And so all of that's kind of added to the burden, that, and it's hard to project what's going to come next in that area. So that's one piece. Um, the other fact that I think is a good one to keep an eye on as we move towards the, the next budget with, with the governor will be the cap that Bart mentioned. Because as he said, um, the funding formula actually um, called for us to have, and Bart, if I get the number wrong, remind me, I think for this year we, we were projected for $10 million more by the uh, formula than we actually received. And what cut that back was a 6.5% cut. Right. So we didn't get the full funding. We got uh, six and a half percent more than we had the year before, and, and this coming year it's ten percent. And as you notice in the forecast, he's projecting a one and a half percent increase over each of the next years after that budget. We really don't know what that is, and that's what he said. And depending on whose forecast you look at, that number can be anywhere from zero to whatever percent you want to put in there. That could be very favorable to a Westerville, depending on what they do. 
um, or it could be not as favorable. And I know there's uh, several school districts are starting to work on legislators since we're at mid biannual review on the next budget. Um, so those are, um, are variables that are important. And the other one that um, wasn't mentioned I think is important is although the economic upturn has been slow, it has been up. And collections on revenues, housing sales, et cetera, is I think spell um, good relief for. So that 2017 renewal um, is an important point. We're very healthy to there. In fact, I don't think our expenditures exceed our revenues until 2018. And a big portion of that is the eight million that comes off that first half from the collection. So we're, we're really in, in good stead if we, if we stay the course. And I, I think that's what we want to do. And keep an eye on these little volatile pieces that can shift the winds real quickly for us. So I appreciate the update. Anything else? Thank you, Bart. Would you call the roll on the resolution? Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. French? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The updated five-year forecast has been approved. Moving on to 9.03 on the agenda this evening, this is a resolution to approve the application for one-time records disposal according to the records retention schedule. Could I have a motion for this, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, Bart, would you like to talk about this? Yes, please. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, this is a really a, we do this, we bring this to you around May every year. We have a records retention disposal policy, uh, what records we keep for how long. Uh, we've attached a list to this to show what records we're disposing. Uh, we basically bring this to, to you for approval. Uh, these do meet the records. Uh, life cycle, I guess, but lack of a better word, that are eligible to be disposed of, and this basically is a resolution giving us authority to dispose of those records. I, I will say before you vote, just in case there's another question, we actually, uh, I've talked about this now, this is my third year that I've talked about records retention. We do have a need in this district to, in, to improve our records re, um, imaging so that we can have more access to records easier. Um, uh, doc, uh, Bob Line went out and did a, a proposal. I think we had four or five companies that submitted um, proposals of what they would do. To update these records over a course of three to five years is about $350,000 to do them all. So I'm not suggesting we do them all right now, but I would like to probably in October, you'll probably see this on the line in the five-year forecast to do some kind of a, anywhere from a three to five-year plan to update all of our records as far as records imaging, which would be record board, board reports. Anything that we do, it's also, I think, uh, put in there a plan that we're actually, when we're creating the documents, it actually scans them so we don't, we're kind of stopping the bleeding a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that we have a, we do have a plan in place. We'll bring that at a future date for records retention, uh, policy, records imaging. Okay, good. Any questions regarding these records and their retention schedule? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Dr. French? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. 9.03, the resolution to approve the application for one-time records disposal has been approved. 9.04 is a resolution to approve the fiscal year 2014 amended appropriations for all funds. Could I have a motion on this, please? So moved. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, Mr. Griffith, I will turn this over to you as well. <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, this resolution, we, we typically um, would have brought this next month for a, a, approval. We typically do our final appropriations and, and then our rough, for this year and then our final appropriations for next year. It, the reason we brought them to you now is the state aid grant that Mr. Reeves has been working on has was finally been approved. Uh, that grant for this district is worth $1,450,000. We did not have that in the appropriations because it was a new grant. So in order for us to spend that money, and it's my understanding that has to be spent by June 30, we needed to bring it to you today versus uh, next month. The other line item on there is a workers' compensation fund. We're actually asking, uh, we had some uh, cases that came a little higher than anticipated. Uh, we're actually asking you to increase that amount as well to $135,000 on that line item as well. So there's only two lines on this document that you see. You do have all the funds in front of you, but the only two we're increasing are those two. Questions or comments? Hearing none, would you call the roll, please, Bart? Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. French? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The amended appropriations has been approved. Moving on to item 10, which is the personnel consent calendar for this evening. Could I have a motion on the consent agenda, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, 
Mr. Joukowsky. Thank you, President, Mr. Baker, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg, before you this evening is our um, uh, May consent agenda. We've had a uh, few days to resolve it or review it. I believe any questions have been answered and resolved. I do want to throw out a couple highlights. One is a resignation. Don't usually highlight resignations, but you got to hear Mr. Randy Snyder speak this evening, and I do want to make note of that. Randy is our assistant manager in transportation. He's got an opportunity to move to a neighboring district as their uh, manager. So it's a promotion for him. While it's bittersweet sweet for him, um, we do want to wish him the best. <clears throat> You'll see a contractual status change we have named, and hopefully we'll um, appoint a principal this evening at Walnut Springs. That is the current assistant principal, Ms. Becca Yanni. Uh, with her vacancy, then comes another recommendation as the assistant principal. We're going to recommend Mr. Ernest Clingsdale as well. We also have um, two other principal uh, recommendations this evening. One of them is Sari Bertram for the principal of Point View, and then Joe Joseph Euler is the principal of Alcott. And um, when we get done, a couple of those folks are here. We'd like to introduce them to you once you guys get done with your business at the end of the meeting. The only other thing I'd like to bring up on this evening on the agenda is the um, reemployment of the administrative contracts that were up for action this year. Uh, you have um, received those and the recommendations uh, for such as my recommendation that the board approve the consent agenda as it is presented to you this evening. Comments or questions? You were busy this month, Kurt. Appreciate it. We're just getting started, Dr. French. You'll see, <laughs> see you next month. Uh, with the bigger list, so. Next month, yes. But thank you. Yes, it's quite. It's been. It's been a great month so far. Yes. And I'm very pleased to see the administrators who are here this evening. It's. Uh, it's great to have you, and it's great that we're filling these positions well in advance. And I very much appreciate that calendar. It has not always been that way in this district, and I appreciate that. It's been a lot of hard work from a lot of people um, from the um, district as a whole, so um, it's, it's a lot good of people news. get credit for it. And I remember voting to employ Randy, and I really hate to accept his resignation. Oh. Do you call the roll, please, Bart? Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. French? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The consent agenda has been approved. Excuse me, Dr. Nestor Baker. Could I introduce? I do uh, want can. to introduce Joe Ewer is here. Joe's up front. Hi, Joe. He's the principal of Alcott. <laughs> <laughs> and Sherry's back in the back. Sherry Bertram will be our principal at Point View, so they took time to come this evening. So, Well, then it's a good thing we voted for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on in the agenda this evening. Policy consent number 11 on the agenda. There are no policies up uh, this evening. Number 12 is recommended action. This is old business. This is bringing back for final reading some, some components of curriculum this evening. 12.01 is the final reading for a recommendation to revise Engli English language arts courses of study and to purchase textbooks and materials. Could I have a motion on this, please? So moved. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, we had our first reading last time and we had a fair amount of uh, discussion and, and I asked a lot of questions. And we're now back for uh, the second reading, the final reading on these particular courses of study. Are there any comments or questions related to the English language arts? No, I, there, there was one thing I noticed that I didn't see, um, and it was, um, we talked about allocations for the instructional materials. Mm -hmm. Did I miss that, or is it? That was sent to us early in the week. Uh, so you did? The secondary resource, I might have brought it. Yeah, that was sent out. I keep a lot of things in that bag Sorry. I carry around with me. I, I knew she, she was going to do it, and she talked about doing it, yeah, so I, I apologize, Jen. You've been wonderful getting all this together. I... Yeah. Let's just Diet Coke on the corner. Okay. <laughs> Other questions while Tracy reads that? I do have something I'd like to ask the board to consider. As you know, last time I brought up the idea that I was concerned um, 
about making sure that what we approve does meet our policy statement and that our policy statement says that uh, information related to assessments will be included in the courses of study. Uh, we don't have those listed in these particular courses of study at this time. We have been on a really fast roll to get this done according to the requirements that the state has placed on us. Given that we do not have the assessments ready at this point in time, we're not ready to do that yet because we need to get more familiar with what the state's doing. We need to really get a handle on those state assessments and what they mean for us and what they are going to do to us and how we're going to handle that. So what I would like to ask the board to consider this evening is an amendment for uh, this course of study and I'll be making this the same request as an amendment for each of these items on the agenda. And I would, I, I would like to ask you to consider, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget, a line added to this course of study saying that information regarding assessments will be provided at a later date after familiarization with the new state assessments. Could I ask if you'd be interested in considering that amendment? In other words, I need a motion if you are. Meaning the new park assessments or what are you speaking of? Park Pretty assessments much. and any other assessments that come along mm -hmm. from the state. Mm -hmm. Well, they have some, they have some, yes. uh, but not all. Yes. Yeah. But so you're talking about that uh, by policy, we really need to have an assessment in place for each one of these um, we areas We need to have information related to the assessments right. and the interventions. And so we don't have to identify the specific assessment. We just have to have information related to those. And. Uh, so what you would like to do is bring in an amendment that simply says we recognize that we don't have an assessment at this time. We're trying to um, adhere to uh, kind of state standards and process. And so assessments are a part of what we would like to do. We don't have them yet in much nicer words than what I just said. Oh, I think your words are actually nicer than well, mine. I, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, I, what we are looking at is um, the state pushing hard on us and on our people to make sure that we get these approved so that our teachers can begin teaching them next year, so we can get the materials ordered so they can have them on hand next year, and rushing into the identification of assessments and interventions uh, in a blanket way is probably not the most effective way to go about approving curriculum. So, but I also do not in any way want to suggest that we are not um, cognizant of our own policy. I, I, would, uh, I would make a motion. Yeah, how do you want me to word that? <laughs> I, I, we have a motion on the amendment I as would, stated. A yeah, motion on the amendment as stated that we follow our policy of having an assessment process in place. Uh, I mean, clearly, that's not the wording that we want. Um, For those that are not already in place. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. So what we're looking at, what, what I said was information uh, regarding assessments uh, will be provided at a later date after familiarization with the new state assessments. I don't see how we can not do that yeah. unless we choose to adhere to this policy, this policy, this policy, but not that policy and that policy and that policy. Exactly. So I have a motion on the amendment. Is there a second on the amendment? This is not the. Um, I ask, ask a question. Is this amendment just going to be one? Are you going to do amendment for every one of the readings on here? Or are you just going to do I one am. amendment? I am. Yeah. For the, it could just be. Can I get away with doing one amendment for all of them? Let's do. Oh, good. Let's yeah. do okay. that. I, I would rather than motion. just repeating myself yes. over and over and over. State good in idea. that amendment what you want to accomplish, but I don't think you have to do amendment for each one of these. Good. Right. right. Then we'll do an amend. I'm asking, I have a motion on the amendment for all <coughs> courses of study. For all that we have previously yes, said. For all items on the agenda this evening. I'll second it. And I now have a second on the amendment. Bart, would you call the roll on the amendment only? Mr. Villardo. Yes. Mrs. Davidson. Yes. Dr. French. Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. All of the final readings on the recommendations for the courses of study this evening have been amended. Dandy. Can, can yeah. I ask, just, I don't know if this is an appropriate place for me to ask the question. Why not? Clarification. We're not waiting on the state assessments 
to be approved to be part of our course of study. Correct. Okay. Um, I think that's All a point of clarity for everybody. All will be added. That we need assessments that tell us how our kids are doing on our local curriculum against the state standards. Our assessments to our local cur curriculum, which is aligned to state standards, which tells us about how our kids are doing on our curriculum and how they're prepared for whatever state tests come. Do I got it right? You've got it right. Thank you. And interventions. And that will then drive the interventions yes. for instruction. We need to move kids further along or to extend their learning. Got it. Yep. I think we're all on the same page at this point. You see us wrestling with this because what we're trying to do is conform to what the state requires us to do with the children in our districts and with our courses of study, but trying to also protect the children and the educators and the strength of the system by ensuring that we do adhere to our own policy and that we look at assessments and interventions for ourselves. Any more on assessments and interventions and making sure we meet policy? Then how about the English language arts course of study? Do we have comments, questions about the courses, a course of study or the uh, textbooks and materials? It's 1201. It is 1201, not the time, we're not there yet, but is agenda item 1201. I will make a comment regarding, um, uh, once again, the Common Core, which uh, this is what that is. And um, I did uh, look over the materials, and uh, my concern still is with Common Core. Uh, I cannot support it yet. I don't know if I'll ever get there. Um, but I, and a couple of quick reasons are that um, one of the things I'm finding that very difficult is um, for parents to get, understand it, especially when we get to the math part, which is the next one, uh, and being able to help them uh, along. And uh, I know teachers are learning, but I also feel that our teachers are having to teach to the tests. And um, so that is, those are major concerns I have right now with the Common Core. So just so you all know why I'm voting no. <laughs> Any other comments about English language arts? I, I do. I want to thank Jen for putting all the materials out and, and sitting with Carol and I while we yes. asked a bazillion questions. And uh, one, of the, the, one of the books that were out uh, or that she had out was actually from a teacher. Um, what's the teacher's name? Ma Beth Morvey. And it was... Um, uh, uh, a book that she used as um, a resource and it had so many notes in there and she loved the book in fact she loved it so much the district bought it for the other teachers I just I think that's that's fantastic yes so thank you Jen I also want to thank you Jen I appreciate that and I also uh, want to say how much I appreciate a number of the pieces that are to be purchased and that are currently on the list for our students they are sound components of English and language arts that I would hope and expect our students are reading, uh, along with authors that I would certainly expect a well-rounded student in English and language arts to be reading as well. So I do, I do think we're on the right track there. I will, Carol, I am with you um, about the park assessments component yes. uh, of the standards from the state. I do not like those at all, but I am in favor of the changes that have been made to the course of study related, especially related to English language arts. I think oh, that we just need to be real cognizant of parents bringing comments or concerns to the board mm -hmm. as they get along with this uh, a little bit in the next couple of years and uh, be aware of their concerns too. So um, I think you know, parents need to feel free to do that and um, um, we need to be aware more. I mean, I visited some of the classrooms, I've talked to some teachers, and uh, I know there are issues out there, but of course, um, we don't hear them all. We don't hear them from parents. A lot of parents will just say, okay, that's the way it is. I can't help you, sorry. And uh, so, you know, they kind of just throw up their hands. Instead of that, we need to, to be uh, supportive of that uh, issue with parents. So. Um, that's where I am with Common Core, and I, I can provide, <laughs> I'm still try reading about it, and, and um, so I know it's the, you know, right now it's the state mandate, um, but things can change. Thank you. Thank you. All right, would you call the roll on the amended 12.01? 
Mr. Villardo? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. French? No. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The revised English language arts course of study has been approved as has the purchase of textbooks and materials. Moving on to 12.02, this is the final reading on the recommendation to revise mathematics course of study and purchase textbooks and materials. This has also been amended. Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, comments or questions related to mathematics? I just have a clarification. When you say has also been amended, are you? The amendment that we did. The amendment we did first applies to this one, but we're not actually amending the resolution. No. no. Gotcha. All right. The things we do to make sure we do it right. Any, any comments or questions regarding mathematics? I want to echo Carol's comments about making sure we do the best we can to work with our parents on this and also to work with our students. This, uh, the mathematics of all the course of study revisions has been the most uh, difficult in many ways for a lot of families and uh, our educators, some of them have had difficulty with it as well. And as we continue to work with professional development, uh, we will also continue to look for ways to better help our families and our students understand as well. Bart, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Villardo. Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. French? No. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The recommendation to revise mathematics course of study and purchase textbooks and materials has been approved. 12.03 is the final reading on the revision of the science course of study and also the resolution to purchase textbooks and materials. Could I have a motion on this, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. And the amendment does apply to this as well. Comments, questions, concerns related to the science course of study or materials? Nope. We're not there yet with Common Core, so, you know, we will. No, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, again, the uh, concerns about the, the uh, testing and so on uh, through all of these, I'm, I'm most concerned about that. I feel like we're doing a lot of testing of our poor kids, but... Um, we are. Uh, yep. I, I love some of what I see in front of me in this science area. Um, it doesn't surprise anybody that I'm an English literature degree, but I'm pretty passionate about STEM. And uh, just uh, I, I have looked through some of the curricula, talked with Jen, and um, I just really like some of what we are trying to unroll and challenge our students sooner um, with some pretty, pretty applicable and rigorous curricula. Um, I love the idea of trying to support parents uh, because some of what my kid is doing now, I'm not sure, and he's only in sixth grade. Um, but I have continue to believe that a great deal of our um, health and future will rest in us getting much more serious about um, science and technology. So I, I'm just uh, very solidly behind this. Ditto. Ditto. Bart, would you call the roll, please? Dr. French? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Item 12.3, the revision of the science course of study and the purchase of textbooks and materials has been approved. Moving on to 12.04, this is the final reading on the recommendation to revise social studies course of study and purchase textbooks and materials related to that. Could I have a motion on the social studies revision, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, are there comments or questions? I don't hear any. Mm -mm. Mr. Griffith, would you call the roll? Dr. French? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The social studies course of study and the related materials have been approved. Before we move on to the next item, I did want to ask John very quickly while we're on curriculum if he could uh, share his thoughts a little bit 
about what's the direction we want to go. And we have been on such a roll and in such a, uh, a pressured state to make the changes that the state has required of us so that our students can be successful in what the state is requiring from them. But now we're through that. And that suggests we now have time to step back and look at our process and identify directions that we want to go. And I wanted to see if you wanted to share some of your thoughts about that. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, it's a great uh, time period to start thinking about that. So some just general foundational pieces. Um, talk about curriculum cycle and where we've been in this kind of fragmented um, approach that I think has been mostly driven by the state timelines and the, the, the revised curriculum that's been presented to us. So it's been a little choppy and, and clearly the experience on a larger scale than just Westerville nationwide around um, the new standards, Common Core, new assessments um, have peaked community and, and uh, parent interest. And I think that's a good thing. So in general, I would look for us to return to a more logical cycle, uh, one that begins with teachers at the forefront. Their responsibility, their expertise is to analyze the standards that are required, but to translate those standards in terms of courses of study and course guides that can be used in the classroom for planning purposes and the direct instruction, which the standards do not do. And that should be the role of our teachers. That's their expertise. That's their, their role in the process. And so a one to two year part of reviewing a curriculum, developing our curriculum, analyzing it and evaluating it, um, and then writing it formally in a format, as you mentioned this evening, the components that we want, the assessment component, the materials component. Uh, the next piece of the cycle would be the materials adoption. Once we have things written and interpreted the way we want, then we, we turn our teachers loose and looking at the variety of materials that are out there, that, which, are, which are evolving as this um, standards movement moves through. And I can tell you this about um, materials. Two, in, in, our, in our rear view mirror, materials has been driven on a marketplace um, by frankly just a couple of large states that have statewide adoptions. And so in order, order to earn those statewide adoptions, California and Texas in particular, you got to conform to what they expect. And that kind of drove the marketplace in a lot of different places. So even the, the belief that there was a variety of materials out there, Algebra 1 is Algebra 1 is Algebra 1, and the books didn't vary a whole lot. What I think is going to open up forward and is part of, our uh, part of our teaching learning roadmap is digital content and the value it adds to classroom experiences. And again, part of my belief as we look at our, our process moving forward is that materials adoption shouldn't just be the paper we see back here, but how do we engage our teachers in discussing what's the valuable digital content out there that can be used to supplement and um, provide instruction to kids. And this extends to video, um, anything teacher made, anything we might be able to purchase, anything we can find for free, Khan Academy. There's a plug for a free site. Um, I think that becomes the new world of materials adoption. Then the most important piece to me, and that's where we've stumbled a little bit with our math adoption, is making sure that the professional development is not so much delivered, but at the end of the day, do our teachers who have experienced the professional development feel confident in their implementation? Now, PD really is in two formats. One is professional development around the materials we get, oftentimes which comes with implications for instructional practice and how to use them, um, learner's manual, for example, to go along with them, but also professional development. What is the change in the standards and their impact on classroom instruction? That's the other part of the professional development. Um, and then the final part of that is implementation. All through that should be a thread of evaluation. How do we feel about what we've written, what we've analyzed? How do we feel about the materials? How do we feel about the PD? Do we feel ready for implementation? So it doesn't feel awkward for teachers who then that translates into awkwardness for kids and then translates to awkwardness at home. Because if the teachers don't feel fully prepared to implement, it doesn't go well in the classroom. Anybody who's tried to lead 25 through kids through something that they didn't feel confident they knew how to do, it's an awkward experience. And kids then go home and say, I'm not quite sure where we're at. And that's not fair to our teachers and our, our kids. So to put that together, the last piece of that is, and this is where I think um, we're, we're in a place that's really important, our public's understanding about what we're doing locally with any statewide uh, initiative or any uh, nationally influenced initiative is really, really critical. Um, so some of the changes in process I could see for us would be, for example, a more open process around our materials adoption. Uh, once our teachers make final selection opportunities for public to come in like we saw this evening uh, as part of our policy on review of materials. So they have 
not necessarily a, a, a so-called vote in the process, but an opportunity to see and, and, and share their experience. Um, same thing with the written curriculum before we move into implementation and adoption, that opportunity for our citizens to see how our teachers at a local level have interpreted those standards and put them into our courses of study. Because all of what I've heard this evening is really about that. How did you take the state standards that were, excuse me, those state and national standards that we're concerned about, and how did you translate those locally into what our teachers need to do? How did you go about the materials adoption? What does that mean for our kids? What was the professional development we gave our teachers so they could be confident in their implementation? That's where I think we need to be. And, and again, I don't think it's a, it was a people mistake. It was the rapid pace at which this went. And if you go back to when we went, started this whole journey, it's about 2009, 2010. And to, to, to shift to where we're at is, is, a, is a long journey. So th the last piece of this is go back to strategic planning. There's a portion in there where the voice of the community says, communicate with us when you make changes to instructional practice. And I think part of this experience is embedded in that community output. So that's a driver for us in terms of how I would view us moving forward um, with our curriculum cycle. And going back, you know, there's two parts of our, our policy. There's course of study adoption and there's course guides and the elements of those pieces. And really starting back there and moving forward with infrastructure that allows for greater teacher input and uh, uh, valuing their input and greater community awareness about what's going on and evaluation, not just the, at the end point, which is student results, which is the thing that's our bread and butter, but you don't get good student results if you don't have good implementation. So we got to measure all of those phases before we get to the test. My big concern with the state, and I've said it to legislators, I've written them, I've talked to them, is, as fast as we've gone with this curriculum, we're talking next year evaluations online in a whole new system. And um, I can share with you that at a recent um, Central Ohio Superintendents Association meeting, there were two state board members there who asked this, reg uh, I'm, I'm, I may get myself in trouble, um, who asked the local superintendents our perceptions on the recent um, piloting of the, the online assessments that went on. Because the information that went from ODE to the state board was that other than a few glitches, things went fine. And from our perspective, and this is what I told them, we'll get it done. Because if you mandate it, we'll get it done for kids and teachers. The question isn't, are you ready? The question is, what amount of resources it take to get to ready? And I listened to uh, John Marshall's and the superintendent in Hilliard describe the number of different people he had in those classrooms to make sure that an online assessment went well. And we just can't afford to do it that way. And I know our own personal experiences, we had a day of glitches, frustrated kids, frustrated teachers. And our folks, IT staff, principals, teachers, worked their tails off to make it right for kids. But we, we can't afford that kind of experience on a high stakes test next year. And um, that's, that's where I've been um, on this whole piece. So I, I echo any community member's expression of frustration about the assessment. Um, and uh, I think we have a, a roadmap towards what we need to do with our curriculum in the future to kind of take care of, clean up some of these concerns. I'm invigorated by the fact that our local community is really interested in what we're teaching, because it hasn't always been like that. And that's a good, that's a good, that's a, uh, a good thing to have going on for ourselves. And we can adjust ourselves to, to meet that need. So. That would be my, where I'd like us to be. Good. Thank you. All right. Moving on in the agenda. Recommended action number 13 on the agenda is for new business, and we have no new business identified this evening, so we'll move on to standing business, which is under item 14 of the agenda. 1401, donations. Could I have a motion on this, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, are there comments or questions on this generosity? I know there is $2,000 worth of um, student fees and what was the other thing in there? Um, lunch money, mm -hmm. helping kids needing lunch money. That is amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Griffith. Dr. French. Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? 
Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes, the donations have been approved. 1402 is a resolution to approve athletic training and partnership agreements with Ohio Health Corporation. Could I have a motion on this, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second. I'm going to invite uh, Athletic Director Extraordinary Andy uh, I to the podium to present on. Uh, <laughs> is that what it says motion. on your business card? It does. Director Extraordinary. It does. It does. Yes. It should. You don't get extra supplemental pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a pat on the back for you later. Good evening. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. That means as much to me, Dr. Kellogg. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Nestor Baker, Dr. Kellogg, Board of Education. Um, the resolution to approve athletic training services for the high schools and middle schools of our district. Uh, the contract with our existing provider, Ohio Health, is set to expire at the end of this school year. The, uh, the bid was put out there, it was known that there were, the, the contract was expiring and we received two proposals for contract. And after careful review by the district administration and the high school athletic directors, we've chosen to recommend that we accept the proposal from Ohio Health and renew our contract with them. The contract length would be for five years and would be in effect for the school years 2014-15, which is next school year, through the school year 2018-19. We've developed a tremendous working partnership with Ohio Health and the quality of service we have received. Some of this is going to sound the same as what Mr. Hershiser said earlier. I probably wrote it first and he piggybacked <laughs> on it. So. Uh, and anyway, the, the service we receive from them is, has been exceptional over these years. Ohio Health goes above and beyond the minimum expectations, and the services they provide go much further than athletic training. And some of the things that Mr. Hershiser mentioned earlier, uh, classes for our coaches, CPR, first aid, sports medicine, the concussion awareness class, the, there's a whole lot of things that the coaches have to do, and Ohio Health helps uh, provide a lot of the training for our coaches. Our, the athletic trainer that from our school is teaching a CPR class tonight for some of our coaches. So they, they do a lot for that. Uh, safety classes for our student athletes, the concussion impact testing, wrestling assessments, uh, body fat assessments, skin checks, th things along that line. Uh, the physician coverage at our athletic events and in our, they make visits to our school when we have kids that are sick or kids that are hurt, they'll come into the uh, training room and see them. Pre-participation exams are the sports physicals that all our student athletes have to take before they can participate. Hundreds of our student athletes take, uh, take advantage of that each year. And the sp uh, sports physicals are tomorrow night at Ohio Health, 5.30 p.m. There's a little plug for that. We get a lot of the kids over there. Uh, in addition to all the things that with the athletic trainers, Ohio Health has become an exceptional community partner for our school district, uh, recently receiving a school partnership award from the OSBA, uh, loaning executives that work in their strategic planning department to our district for some of our strategic planning activities, providing back-to-school backpacks for some of our needy students. The Westerville City Schools Enrollment Center is housed at the Ohio Health Building and all that office space is leased to our district for $1 a year, printing services for documents for our district. And the Westerville Parent Council recognized the value of our partnership with Ohio Health, with Ohio, with Ohio Health by presenting, the, presenting that organization with the Terry Gordon Business Award during our GEM Award ceremony. So the, uh, another interesting fact with Ohio Health, they, I've been around since for quite a while doing this, and Ohio Health came on board in 2007 is when we contracted with Ohio Health. So we've had a nice long working relationship with them, and that uh, the, the contractual amount that we signed with them in 2007 is the same now as it was then and will be in, in effect through this five-year contract, so the cost to the district will remain the same at, at the end of that contract for 12 years. And um, because of this partnership we have developed with Ohio Health, we will realize an annual benefit of over $110,000, and annually that is uh, about $20,000 more than the other pro proposal we received. So we believe that the proposal with Ohio Health is the way to go. 20000 more than the other.
What, explain the that benefit again. that we receive, not the cost, yeah. the benefits that we receive in the contract with Ohio Health, everything that we get, the, uh, the rental, sp the, the space at, at uh, the building, the coverage from the doctors, the classes for our teacher or for our coaches, the physicals, all that stuff valued at mm -hmm. more than what the other proposal was. And again, that that covers all of our high schools. All three high schools and, and all four all middle four. schools. They provide um, athletic training services for the middle schools as well. Okay. Comments or questions? Anybody? Nice. Thank you. Hearing none. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. French? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The athletic training and partnership agreements with Ohio Health Corporation have been approved. Moving on to 1403, this is approval of the 2014 student candidates for graduation from Westerville Central, North, and South High Schools. Who wants to move this forward? So moved. Who wants to second? Second. Yeah. Is Third. It yeah. <laughs> Fourth. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you would like to say this? About is this? cool because this is the first time I've ever cool. gotten to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's our proud privilege to present to the board the list of uh, student candidates for graduation from all three of our high schools. We have our graduations this weekend, Saturday, 10, 2, and 6. six thank you. Um, down at the fairgrounds. It's going to be an awesome event. I have my own with my son on Sunday. I had one two weeks ago, so I'm just full of graduation stuff. Um, you know, I was a high school principal for a long time. Graduations are the single best day for a school system because you get to see all those kids and all the joy and all the family pride that goes on there. So I encourage people to attend, um, and I'm excited to present this for approval. Comments or questions? This is one of the best things that shows up on our agenda all year long. Bart, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Villardo? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. French? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The student candidates for graduation from Westerville Central, North, and South have been approved. Moving on to 1404. Oh, I'm sure it's equally ex exciting to Jeff LaRose. This is a resolution approving <laughs> the summer 2014 capital improvements construction projects bid package 10, paving improvements. Contain your excitement, Mr. Yeah. Rose, and talk to us. So we're, we're going to go from fulfilling graduation requirements Motion to fulfilling right. potholes. Motion in a second before you talk to us. <laughs> so moved. Second. second. There, now. All right. Members of the hey. board. Yes, he's excited. I'm excited. Yeah. It's paving. <laughs> the, this scope of work includes paving repairs at 25 locations and the renovation of the running track at Central High School. Uh, bids were solicited in accordance with the Iowa Vice Code and publicly read on May 6th. We received two bids. The lowest bid was submitted by BNC Blacktop in the amount of 242000 and this includes alternate 10.1, the repair of 15 catch basins. BNC's base bid is 13% under the engineer's estimate. Thus, we are recommending that the board accept the paving improvements bid from BNC Blacktop as presented. Comments or questions? How much is that? I'm looking real quick here. Oh, 242,000. 242, Didn't we do paving touch-ups last year, too? We do or it do every we do year. we do that forever? Every year. Every so year. we're using the same company, but they're doing different spots, I'm assuming. It's not the same company. It's, it's a bit every year. It's a so new it's, company this year? It is. I see. Thank you. Comments or questions additionally? Hearing none, Bart, would you call the roll? Mr. Villardo. Yes. Dr. French? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yep. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Let the paving commence. <laughs> 1405 is a resolution to dedicate land owned by the Westerville City School District to the City of Westerville for purposes of a recreational pathway, which land is generally described as the south side of East Walnut Street mm -hmm. in Westerville, Ohio. Could I have a motion on this, please? So moved. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, is there anyone who's going to address this? Mr. LaRose. <laughs> it's getting better. <laughs> uh, this summer, the city is planning the construction of a recreational pathway along Walnut Street between Hempstead and Spring Roads. This resolution is per the request of the city as part of their initiative to expand and improve these pathways. 
The land is uh, being requested is 0.48 acres in front of Mark Twain Elementary that runs parallel to East Walnut Street as described in the warranty deed that is part of this resolution. 77% of the land is already part of the current road easement. The remaining 23% is to move the existing right of way 10 feet south to accommodate the path improvements. Uh, included in the land request are two temporary easements to provide access uh, f uh, during construction. The work is scheduled to start next month and be substantially complete prior to the start of school on August 13th. And we are recommending that uh, the board approve dedicating the, l the land as presented. Comments or questions, please. Mm -mm. Do you anticipate this coming back again a different at a different location or you have no idea I suppose? I do know that the last phase of the path improvements um, for this particular section for FY15 uh, is extending the path from Walnut, uh, along Walnut Street from Spring Road to Monroe Lane and along Hempstead from Spring Road to Woods Edge Lane but that does not uh, impact our property. Okay. Jeff, I appreciate the work that you put into this, uh, talking with the city, going back, reworking the maps and so forth. I appreciate that effort on our behalf. Would you call the roll, please? Dr. French? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The resolution to dedicate the land has been approved. Item 15 on the agenda is the second portion of public comments. This portion of public comments is for comments for the good of the order. However, as in our other portion of public comment, you are limited to five minutes in your speaking and that time will show for you. We have several people signed up to speak tonight and the first person is Peg Duffy. You as board members through your application process have revealed what apparently you believe to be the attributes for the forthcoming board appointment. Members of the community also have, ex have expectations for the person who will represent us. We seek a board member who will listen to all people in the district, a board member who acknowledges that all municipalities of the district are equal partners in educating our students, a board member who genuinely respects and understands differing opinions. A board member who is committed to open public discussion on challenging issues. Finally, a board member who can balance the wants and needs of students and staff with the realities of the taxpayer checkbook. Thank you, Peg. The next person is Kevin Hoffman. Good evening. Uh, I come this evening uh, expecting, hoping that all five board members are going to be here this evening, but unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Crow is not able to be here. I know that there was a uh, celebration uh, honoring her uh, last week. Unfortunately, I was out of town, uh, and so I was hoping to say a few words this evening, and thanks. Uh, if, you, with, if the board's willing, I will continue, hoping that she might see it on TV, if nothing else. Um, you know, having served with uh, Cindy on the board for 12 years and been involved with the district for probably the entirety of her career, I believe that uh, I can speak to the breadth of great work that occurred during her time here in the Board of Education. In her 14 plus years as a board member, Cindy has consistent, consistently demonstrated a great passion for our students, our staff, and our community as a whole, and always had a focus on ensuring that the district was the best it could be. As I was preparing for tonight, I thought about a number of the great works that this district has accomplished on her t during her time on the board. Some of those include, you know, started way back when with the building of three new schools, renovating and expanding every other school in the district, implementing a district-wide redistricting plan, which has stood the test of time better than most, um, hiring three superintendents, Good to see you, Dr. Kellogg, and, and two, two treasures, and you, and you as well, Mr. Griffith. Uh, creatively acquiring this building, we now know as the Early Learning Center, the home for the district's preschool program and administrative offices. 
twice expanding the magnet program and now you guys are bringing it back again, so thank you. Uh, implementing the International Baccalaureate Program, creating the a Academic Enrichment Center, developing a curriculum that successfully transitioned limited English speaking uh, students to become high school graduates. Building the great partnership with Ohio Health that brought about their recognition earlier this evening. Leading the implementation of Challenge Day, uh, which we all know is a, a great uh, addition to this district that brings character education to our high schools. You know, those are just a few of the great things that uh, Cindy has done, and I wish you were here, Cindy, to hear this. But I uh, wanted to let you know that, uh, you know, I, pre I appreciate all that you've done, and I know that there are so many out in this community, as I've been out and about uh, over the past years, that have asked me how you're doing. i uh, let them know you're thinking about you. Um, and so I wanted to come tonight to tell you that I, too, was thinking about you. It's been my pleasure pleasure and privilege to serve with you as a board member and to call you a friend and I wanted to let you know tonight that uh, my thoughts and prayers are with you always. So uh, congratulations to the board members uh, for another great me evening uh, meeting this evening and to Cindy, uh, congratulations to you on a phenomenal career as a board member here in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. The next speaker is Dave Fitzpatrick. Good evening, Dr. Kellogg, uh, Dr. Nestor Baker, board members. <clears throat> I'd like to comment on the open position here on the board. Uh, I think you guys are doing a tremendous job. I don't think we need to fill it. <laughs> um, Is that no. a motion? <laughs> um, I think you guys all probably have your own criteria uh, that you'll have in place as you consider the candidates for the position. I'm not here to push any particular candidate, but I'd like to offer a couple comments and suggestions that maybe you'll take into account as you consider those that are applying for the position. Uh, number one, how long have they lived in Westerville? Um, I think that's really important. You have somebody that's lived here for five years versus someone that's been here for 15 years. I think the longer you're here in the city, the more you understand the fabric of the community and what makes Westerville the, the town it is, and I think that's ultimately important. It, to that end, how involved are they uh, in the activities in, in, in Westerville? Do they have any kids? Uh, do they have any kids currently in the district? If you had a candidate that maybe had kids years ago in the district versus someone that currently has children in the district, I might weight the candidate that has children in the district currently. And, and not just have children in the district, how involved are they? in their children's activities at the schools and the associated activities of the schools themselves. Um, do they have any kind of a business background? I think that's, that's a key component to consider as well. With regards to the recent election, I don't think you should necessarily just pick you know, somebody that's run recently in the election, but I do think it should be considered that those, and I don't know who, if any, are, are, are currently considering running, but if they were partaking in the election, the, the recent election, there's a lot to be said for the time and effort that was put into that, money that was put into that uh, in running for the position back in November. Um, anyway, those are just a few of my suggestions and comments. I hope you take them into consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the list is Eric Swilling. It's good to see many of you again. It's been a while. Uh, I want to read Doug Krinsky's comments. He asked me to share these with you before I get into my own. Uh, my name is Doug Krinsky, and I've lived in the district since 1988. I have three kids attending that had attended the district and one that still does. I wanted to touch base about the open seat on the board. I'm recommending Jim Burgess for the board. Jim has been a dedicated resident in the district for quite some time, as many of you know. He is well versed on district matters and has run for the board in the past. Jim has extensive business management experience, is married with ch three children, and understands how the board works. He is the right person for the job at the right time in the district. As a voter, longtime resident, taxpayer, concerned parent in the district, uh, Doug Krinsky thinks it's important we have good representation on the board of the district residents' views. Jim will provide a good balance of what the residents are looking for. He is a consensus builder of varying opinions, good listener. 
He tries to understand all views before forming a final opinion, and almost 4,000 district residents voted for Jim in the last election. I hope when the board makes its final decision that Jim is the person that is appointed for all the reasons I've laid out here. I think the last thing residents want to see is a person appointed that has not run for the board, a person that has not consistently dedicated themselves to helping the district by attending board meetings, voicing their opinion and volunteering to research issues to compile facts to support the opinions. To have someone now decide to put their name in the hopper that has not put in the hard work and time to help the district up to this point would be a mistake in my opinion. I look forward to hearing who the board picks and I hope that person will be Jim Burgess. And so ends my tenure as town crier. Comments and an ask. Comments. Uh, from Dr. Kellogg, uh, this has been such a great time of visionary leadership within the district. We have been very excited to see what you've done. And uh, with the board, um, we a lot of us in the community that have been kind of in the middle and a little bit more on the fiscal conservative end, we've been laying back, seeing how things have gone. Um, from Dr. Kellogg to each one of the four of you, we've been pleasantly surprised at how you have done things well. You have made significant positive impact on change for the better for the students, for the community. And not only what you've done, but in the manner you've done it and the tone that you've taken. So, well-deserved praise. My ask, three things that I got from the lessons of Noah. One, with faith and family, you can overcome anything, including biblical curses. Two, have a plan. It wasn't raining when they first started swinging the hammer. You've done a great job engaging the community, the staff, and getting the strategic plan in place. We're excited to see those things start to come around. Three, this is the ask. Don't miss the boat. You're going to have some people who are applying for that open position, and we need some diversity. I'm not here to support one person over another, but you need some diversity on the board to help continue the great things that you're doing. In five months, you've got the community healing. We need to have that continue to move forward. We need somebody who has some understanding of business. Whether they serve something, I don't care if she ran a software business or he ran a nail salon. Somebody who understands how to do competition. We, see, we, we probably need to do some RFPs because at some point we do need to go back to the community. We've had incredible, incredible generosity from the administrators who have gone without. Three out of four districts went without a raise. We're now in negotiations with those people and fiscal conservatives believe those people need something. They need a reward for pitching in when we needed it. Okay, I, I don't envy your position. You've done a great job, but please. Don't miss the boat. Make a great choice. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. The next person, Linda, I'm not sure how to pronounce your your last name. Is it Buchler? Oh, good. I got it right. Uh, Madam President, members of the school board, Superintendent Kellogg, and uh, fellow citizens, um, I kind of want to touch upon the vacancy as well. I, um, <clears throat> but before I do that, I did want to say uh, I haven't been able to be here since January due to my own medical issues, but um, I was glad to see tonight the, the cohesion and the collaboration with, the, with this board. Um, it really, you know, the bantering and, you know, respectful um, disagreements at times, but it, it was just fun to see that and be able to laugh with you. Um, but anyways, uh, I moved to Westerville, um, I'll be 30 years in about three weeks. So I've been here for a little while now. And uh, I remember being here when I moved here, it was the uh, red ribbon and the blue ribbon. I'm sure you remember that. Yes. Everybody had them on their mailboxes um, as to which side you were on. and. Um, the last election, the citizens of the Westerville community had a choice of eight qualified candidates and to choose from for the three open seats on the Board of Education. And now just a short time later, due to very unfortunate circumstances, uh, another seat has opened up. Um, I am here, it is my hope that the uh, board would choose the next highest voter, uh, Jim, if he so chooses to to run, and I understand that he does. Um, 
I met Jim approximately four years ago. I know he has the desire to put the children first, and he does have a child in the district. On the uh, first meeting of the board in January, I sat here and heard um, that uh, the president expressed that we would have some diversity, and I encourage that. Uh, I now encourage the president and the board to do just that by appointing Jim uh, to the vacancy that he spent so much time and effort into last fall. I believe he told me he went through three or four pairs of shoes <laughs> out there campaigning. And um, just, I, I would like to see somebody who has done that uh, because a lot of us have supported those other five candidates as well as some of you that are sitting there. And these people have worked very hard, as you know. And um, I just encourage you to get to know Jim. He's very kind. He's a very intelligent person and a very capable person. And I think you would find that his goals are actually the same as all of yours and that he's uh, capable and willing to work with all of you for the good of the district. Um, it's a great opportunity to have some badly needed healing in this community, and uh, I hope the uh, board will embrace that opportunity. I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Linda. The last speaker this evening is Rod Clay. <clears throat> Well, I, I too am here to speak to you about the vacancy, and I am here to recommend um, one person, uh, uh, again, uh, Jim Burgess. Um, uh, by the way, I have lived in Westerville 32 years, and all four of my children graduated from Westerville South, but they're all grown now. I've known Jim uh, for several years and have worked side by side with him on many projects for our schools and our community. On all of these projects, Jim's objectives have always been the good of the schools and the good of the community. I have never observed in all of my dealings with Jim even the smallest hint that he is in any way interested in something for himself. It has always been the good of others and of the community. Jim gets involved because he sees a need that the schools and the community have and he is willing to devote himself to meeting that need, whatever the expense and time and money and effort he has to pay. Jim is also one of the easiest, most pleasant people to work with that I've ever had the good fortune to know. Again, for Jim, it is always about everyone pulling together for the common good and everyone pitching in in any way they can so that the objectives can be achieved and the most good done for the most people. Even though he has frequently had leadership roles on these projects, he has never pulled rank, never acted as if he is better than anyone else on the team, and never refused to do any job because it was beneath the dignity of the leader. If a job needed to be done and it was for some reason not possible at that time to get it done any other way, Jim just rolled up his sleeves and did it without any complaint or fanfare. That is just the kind of guy he is. Jim is also unfailingly upbeat and positive. There were many times working on these projects when challenges came up that might have discouraged many other leaders. I know that often they discouraged me, but Jim never seemed to give in to discouragement. He is always looking at how the best, in fact, some real good, can be achieved even in the most daunting and dismal circumstances. Kind of related to that, that very valuable attribute uh, is his resourcefulness and pluckiness. Jim always seems able to think outside the box. There were many times on these projects when we seemed to have exhausted all of our options. Nothing was working the way we had expected or hoped, and no one seemed to know what to do next. Frequently in those situations, it was Jim who came up with some completely unexpected suggestion, and more often than not, those suggestions had some success when nothing else did. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Jim Burgess will be a tremendous addition to the Westerville Board of Education team. And I'm also absolutely sure that it will be only a matter of days or weeks before every member of the board will be saying so. In fact, I fully expect that after only a meeting or two, after observing Jim's energy and enthusiasm, after hearing some of his original and insightful ideas for the district, and getting to know Jim as the warm and personable and caring man that he is, you will be saying, wow, we certainly made the right choice. Now, if I may just change gears a little bit and mention yet another reason you should choose Jim to fill this vacancy, besides the fact that he is the best candidate for the job, 
The other reason you should choose Jim to fill this vacancy is because doing so will go a long way toward mending some of the fences that many of you have acknowledged need to be mending and to healing wounds that many of you have acknowledged need to be healed. As many of you have observed in recent months, there is regrettable divide in our community and some regrettable suspicion and bad feeling. This is unfortunate, this is tragic, because as Jim has said, and as many of you have said, we are all for the same thing, the very best possible education we can provide for our students. And it is unfortunate that our occasional differences of opinion about how to achieve that cause, oh, I'm sorry, achieve that, cause us to doubt the motives of an, and intentions of those with whom we do not always see eye to eye. May I be so bold as to suggest that perhaps the best way to ensure that we provide the very best education we can to our students is to ensure that there is a broad range of experience and background and philosophy on the board. That the board consists of members who bring as many different perspectives to its deliberations as possible. Isn't it possible, in fact I would humbly suggest that it is a fact, that the background, experience and perspective of Jim Burgess would add something to the board that would greatly enrich it and expand it and challenge it to see new things and to see old things in new ways. Jim Burgess would bring to the board an expertise and energy and vision that I most respectfully submit it would greatly benefit from and that would translate into a really excellent educational experience for all of our students. Please give his application and his candidacy your most thoughtful and deliberate consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all of the speakers who have signed up to speak this evening. So we'll move on to board comments. Would any board members like to talk this evening? Um, I'm very, very short, but I'd like to thank um, everyone that spoke tonight. Um, we haven't had this many people <laughs> since Nancy took over. So, <laughs> so, so we appreciate yeah. that. We appreciate your comments and, uh, and uh, truly we listen. Uh, and then the other uh, comment that I want to make is that um, um, this past week, um, Mrs. Davidson and I were both at uh, attended Heritage Middle School Career Day, and it was fabulous. I am so glad to see the middle schools doing something with careers and having a career day. Uh, these kids are just so, I mean, the choices that they had, uh, the volunteers that came, to talk about their careers were just unbelievable, two pages full. And uh, I, I just uh, couldn't praise this, the, the principal enough. So um, I am just glad that we're doing something with that. And as they get into high school, I mean, careers are what it's all about. And uh, I, was, um, I was pleasantly surprised and happy to have that. So that's my comments, thank you. It was nice, Carol. It was very nice. Um, I'm gonna go next. So I would like to say happy retirement to the retirees once again. Um, we appreciate all that you have done for our, our children in our district. Um, second to the speakers, I hear you, I, I hear what you're saying and I thank you for your thoughts. Um, and then to Kevin, I will make sure that Cindy sees this and she will appreciate this and thank you very much. Uh, dovetail off of uh, Carol just a little bit. I, I'm almost speaking to uh, perhaps all of the schools, uh, staff, teachers, et cetera, in our district. We've tried to attend as as many <laughs> things as we could in the last couple of weeks. Um, high schools, evening of excellence, all three, and middle school stuff, and elementary. I said, some schools uh, picnic today, and just, you know, we try to support all of that. And I'm just. It's just, you would not believe, my friends, you would not believe the number of awards and excellence that is happening um, for so many of our students and the teachers are just, it was just amazing. So I think in, in one way I'm saying, if I didn't make it, if we didn't make it maybe to your event, please uh, don't think it wasn't uh, because we weren't um, caring about it. Just try to go to as many as we can with, work and life and so on. Um, thanks to the Westerville Education uh, 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 Foundation. Uh, I don't know how many of you played putt-putt this last Saturday, uh, but we played it in the rain. It was a blast. Um, I beat both of my children just like that on the record. Um, don't Except need to make you were them. cheating, I saw. I cheat? Yeah. 
I, um, I, I got nothing on that one. Um, and so, so anyway, for that, that kind of goes in line with all the people that support our schools. It's just really incredible stuff out there. And to all of you who spoke, I hope that you will hear me very clearly that um, I, I take what you said very seriously. I can't speak to any particular candidate, obviously. But uh, Mrs. Duffy, listening to all, all munici municipalities are important, general respect for differences of opinion. Um, I hope that I can look at you and everyone in here and say, I, I am going to do that. One of my favorite books of all time is a historical book called Team of Rivals. It's about Abraham Lincoln bringing together people that he competed against most vociferously. And he formed probably the strongest cabinet they had ever had at a time when this nation was in deep weeds. That's just to say, you might be surprised at the diversity of opinion in front of you. This is not a monolithic group up here. And so as we seek more diversity, uh, understand we have some diversity already. We don't really vote as lockstep as what you might think. Um, Eric, I really, I appreciate your comments. And Rod, Rod, thank you for speaking truly, all of you. Um, thoughtful, um, compassionate, uh, passionate about the district. Um, Dave, I, really, I love, I love some of you. There you are. Uh, length in Westerville, understanding the fabric of the community, and that's pretty good. It's pretty important. Involved in schools, that's pretty important. Um, so again, I, c candidates and who is wanting to be, I don't even know. I don't even know yet. Uh, but I will take, I, I'm not going to speak for all of us, but, well, kind of, we will take this moment seriously. Partly because of some things that Kevin said. That whether you agree with the way Cindy voted through her 14 years, every time or not, is unimportant to me. What is important to me is that she is a, a woman of integrity and value. And Kevin, I am deeply grateful for you coming forward and speaking to her, uh, whether she is here or not. And, I, and I'm quite sure that uh, Tracy will share. Um, and uh, Dr. Kellogg, um, you said something earlier I want to go back to. I, really, I didn't mean to speak this long, but I, you said something earlier I want to go back to. I'm calling him Dr. Kellogg because I've been chastised through emails that I'm not supposed to call him John. So, Sir, Sir Kellogg. <laughs> He's the one that wrote the email. That's why. He's, uh, John said earlier, and I wrote it down, you don't get good student results if you don't have good implementation. Man, that's good. And uh, whether that's through curriculum or whether that's through sports, we talked about sports tonight, whether that's through just the passion of trying to see every kid uh, not survive but thrive. Uh, I just, I am, I am way past being honored and serving up here with you all with this group and with whoever will be in that seat. I take what you say seriously. We will not always agree, but I take what you say seriously. And, and I think we are listening to the community. That's enough. I do not have anything of substance to add to the comments that have been. Although Carol said you took over the board. She did say that. You did say she took over the board. I, I knew since she became. I, I, knew, what you, I knew what you meant. 
she's sitting. <laughs> sitting <laughs> Sorry. Ignoring you. Yeah, I noticed. What? <laughs> yeah. Tracy said to turn your mic off. <laughs> Additional comments? <laughs> okay. All right. I just have a couple things I want to say. I really, again, I want to welcome our new people. Uh, we're very glad you're here. This is an exciting place to be. This is a fine district, and I expect, as you can tell by the comments, uh, people are engaged here. They are involved here, and sometimes we do wrestle, and sometimes we do agree, sometimes we do not. But the remarkable strength of Westerville is, uh, I think, Dave, the, the phrase you used, the fabric of this community is strong and um, well woven. So welcome. I'm very glad that, that you are here. We are all glad you're here. The only thing I, I would say about the board vacancy is I have participated in filling board vacancies a few times in the past. It's never easy. There is always a great deal to be considered and there is always a great deal of discussion. And we each bring our thoughts, our considerations, our beliefs about the agenda of the district and the need uh, that faces us on the board for an individual to join with us. Uh, but the decisions, we each wrestle with those decisions extensively uh, before we come to an individual decision and then before the board itself comes to its decision. So we do take into account everything that is said and we will certainly be studying all of the application materials that are provided to us by those who choose to apply and we will then move forward. Is there anything, Bart or John, and see, I called him Bart and John, that you would like to say? I, well, I might suggest if, and I don't recall the date, if we want to put out one last time, the closing date for applications. I'm not sure that this will air before that, but for those of you who are seated here, uh, you have until, uh, well, through Wednesday to get your application in, four o'clock. Apply now or forever hold your peace. All right, Bart, anything you'd like to say? Okay. Dates, times, and locations of next meetings. We will meet on Thursday, May 29th at 6 o'clock for an executive session. And on June 4th and 5th, it says 5.30. You may see that that is an earlier time depending on board member schedules. We'll talk about that uh, later. The board will also meet on Monday, June 9th and Monday, June 30th for a regular session at 6 o'clock p.m. here in the Early Learning Center. With that, I would ask for a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. There will be no action taken after we leave executive session. Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. With a motion and a second, Bart, would you call the roll? Mrs. Davidson? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. French? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. The board now moves into executive <coughs> session. Thank you all for coming.